hello, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I'm your virtual adventure guide here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a big new audience today, and so if you are joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I'm really excited today because today marks the beginning of a pretty epic series over our next six uh, sort of business days, so to speak, with some incredible laureates of the Gairdner Awards. The Gairdner Foundation showcases and celebrates some of the most amazing biomedical and health researchers in the world, Dozens of their winners have gone on to win Nobel Prizes, and really they are one of Canada's and the world's most spectacular organizations for highlighting and making sure people know about the incredible work that scientists around the globe are doing. Now to kick off our, our exciting series, we've joined today by Dr. Daniel J. Drucker. Uh, he is at the University of Toronto and uh, Sinai Health as a clinician scientist where he studies and helps heal hormone diabetes, uh, works with obesity, and the gut endocrine system. So I'm excited to welcome him to the broadcast. Thank you so much for our audience joining today in Goddard, Lafayette, Louisiana, and a crown in North America. And without further ado, Dr. Drucker, welcome to the broadcast. Well, thanks very much. Uh, great to uh, chat with you. And I'm going to give you um, a little tour of science and some personal stories uh, about how I got to do uh, what I do. And let me just start with an overview taken from last year's Gardner award lectures. And this really shows what I work on. It's uh, a bunch of drugs based on a hormone GLP-1 or an enzyme that breaks down this hormone, DPP-4, or a related gut hormone, GLP-2. And work over the last few decades has actually resulted in these basic science discoveries becoming medicines to treat metabolic diseases. So let's kind of dive in. And here's what I'm going to chat about and, and leave time for questions. Basically, who am I? Uh, how did I get to do what I uh, do? Um, how did it happen? What did the discoveries mean? And uh, is this all I do or do I actually have time to do other stuff that, that's fun as well? So I have to start out by um, acknowledging my parents. You know, when, when you're in high school, um, you sometimes have an ambiguous relationship with your parents, understandably. Uh, my parents were both refugees from uh, the Second World War in Europe, uh, ultimately met in Israel where they were able to find refuge after the war as, as uh, Jewish refugees and got married. And then uh, a few years later, moved to Canada where uh, I was born. Uh, this was me, I think I was about uh, three or four years old here. I look a little uh, sort of uh, struck by the camera and, and the gaze, et cetera. There was no color in pictures back in those days, if you can uh, believe it. And, and uh, I didn't have uh, a lot of money at my disposal uh, when I was younger. So I had a lot of jobs. You can see on the left, I delivered a paper called the Montreal Star, which is no longer in existence. We have the Toronto Star, but not the Montreal Star. I still remember how heavy that bag of newspapers was around my neck. Uh, you can see the bag is pretty much larger than I am. And then later on, when I moved to Ottawa in the summer, I had a great job. I sold ice cream. I drove a Dickie D bike, uh, sometimes 12 hours a day and would finish up by taking the bike down to watch the football game and sell more ice cream outside. So, you know, it wasn't born into a career of science with a silver spoon. Um, educated in public school all the way, went to Russell School in Montreal, which no longer exists. It's a, uh, an old folks home, so to speak. Went to Maryville High School in Ottawa, which does still uh, exist. So a lot of good memories there. And then went to undergraduate science at the University of Ottawa. Again, a, a public university in Canada. Most of our universities are public. And that was the basis of my education, finally ending up uh, in 1976 uh, at medical school. Um, kind of terrified in the big city, moved to Toronto, didn't really know uh, anyone. But that's where uh, the adventure started. And after medical school, I uh, took another chance and went to Johns Hopkins uh, in Baltimore to do my internship. Great place. You can see this is the cast of characters uh, who were the medical interns and residents at the time. And in, in the middle is Victor McCusick, who was the uh, chief of medicine at the time. Very famous person in genetics. If you Google McCusick genetics, you'll see he was instrumental in founding the modern day uh, sort of practice of modern genetics. So that was a, a cool place to be. And then I had great mentors and um, some of them could even smile. So this was on the left, uh, the late Jerry Burrow, 
who um, introduced me to endocrinology and uh, told me I should do some research. And on the right, Charles Hollenberg, a very famous uh, endocrinologist and also chair of medicine and physician chief here, also extremely supportive of my career. And the way I got into this science was this person, Joel Habner, who was a, a co-winner of the Gardner Award to, together with me and, and my colleague, Jens Holst, he was kind enough to take me into his lab in 1984 when I had no lab experience, like zero. And so today, you know, those of you listening might find that odd because you get lab experience often much earlier or sometimes in high school, later on as undergrads or doing electives. So I, I really couldn't uh, do anything when I was in the lab. And it was to Joel's credit that he was generous enough to give me a chance. So when I got there, they had just cloned this gene, the glucagon gene. And these are the hormones encoded by the glucagon gene. And we knew about glucagon. That's the blood raising hormone that counteracts insulin action, prevents your blood sugar from going too low. But we didn't know what these other things did. We didn't know what GLP-1 did. We didn't know what GLP-2 did. And that was part of my job, trying to figure out what these things did. So I literally, you know, I don't want, don't want to use the term dump these uh, peptides, but I, I incubated these uh, hormones on a lot of different cells and, and asked, well, did it talk to the cells? Did it activate different processes in the cell? And GLP-1 turns out to stimulate insulin secretion and increase insulin gene expression. And it, it does so in a very glucose-dependent mechanism of action, meaning when the glucose is normal, it doesn't talk to the pancreas and increase insulin. But when the glucose is high, it activates insulin secretion. Now, GLP-1 is broken down very quickly. There are these circulating enzymes that chop it up and inactivate it and get rid of it in our bodies. And so one of the ways that uh, people took advantage of this knowledge was to develop inhibitors of this enzyme. This enzyme is called DPP-4 or dipeptopeptidase 4, and a whole class of drugs was developed to inhibit this enzyme, which potentiated the actions of GLP-1 and was very effective for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Another way that people develop medicines based on GLP-1 action is to activate the GLP-1 receptor with small peptides or, or proteins. And remarkably, the first medicine based on GLP-1 action was isolated from the venom of this lizard that I'm showing you here. It's called a Gila monster or Heloderma suspectum. It's poisonous. So when it bites you, you have a good chance of dying. Yet in its venom, it has a GLP-1-like peptide called Exendin-4, and we cloned this several decades ago, and it's very potent at the GLP-1 receptor. And this turned out in April 28, 2005, to be the first medicine based on GLP-1 action to treat type 2 diabetes. Now, of course, the pharmaceutical industry was very active, and they got into this game very early, and they developed more powerful medicines, including many that we can take once a week to treat type 2 diabetes. These are all GLP-1 medicines, and they're all called tides. So what do these things do? Well, you can see here, these are head-to-head -head studies in people with type 2 diabetes. So this is not type 1 diabetes where your pancreas is destroyed and you need to take insulin for the rest of your life. This is type 2 diabetes where your pancreas is not making enough insulin or the insulin you have is not working well enough. And so we can use medicines to get more insulin made or get insulin working better or acting through other mechanisms to lower glucose. And here's a series of studies with all of these different GLP-1 medicines. And on the left is hemoglobin A1C. It's a measure of glucose control. And you can see this is pretty effective depending on the medicine studied. It's very effective at reducing blood glucose, which is a major aim that we have to treat type 2 diabetes because we know that lowering blood sugar is associated with a reduction in complications. So what are those complications? I think many of you are familiar with them. You can have problems with your eyes and blindness. You can problems with your blood vessels and have amputations or heart attacks and strokes, problems with your kidneys and need to have transplantation or kidney dialysis. And controlling your blood sugar is very important in lowering your risk of these complications. But that wasn't all that these medicines did. 
GLP-1 also talks to your brain to tell you, I'm not hungry. And for many of us, we're kind of, you know, exposed to a, a very rich environment where there's a lot of food uh, everywhere. And a lot of times it's calorie dense and, and very uh, appetizing. And we tend to sort of gain weight. And we've seen, you know, in many parts of the world that we've replaced our concern about famine and starvation with the new concern, which is obesity and overweight and complications arising from those problems. And what these medicines do, you can see here, is they help you lose weight. So on the left is the change in body weight in percentage kilograms. And what you can see is that many of these drugs, particularly the newer ones on the right here, they help you lose your body weight on average in people with diabetes, you know, five, six percent. So if you're starting off at 200 kilograms, you know, you're going to lose 10, 12 pounds on average. If you're starting out at 200 kilograms in, in kilograms, that, that might be, you know, five, six uh, kilograms, 10 kilograms sometimes. So that's pretty meaningful for people with type 2 diabetes who are often trying to lose weight. A big bonus in this story came about six, seven years ago when we learned the results of how these worked in people with diabetes at risk for heart disease. And heart disease is a number one challenge that uh, people with type 2 diabetes face. And amazingly, the GLP-1 drugs not only lower blood sugar, not only reduce your appetite enabling weight loss, but they also reduce heart attacks, strokes, cardiovascular death, and here, as you can see, all-cause mortality is simply they reduce your rates of death. So that's really important to people challenged with these diseases because controlling blood sugar is one thing, and then you have to be patient over time that that will improve your health. But if you know that taking these medicines for a few years will reduce your risk of death, I think that's additional motivation and certainly a benefit. But some of you may have heard of these GLP-1 medicines more recently in the popular press or on social media. So why would that be? Well, Kim Kardashian says she's taking Ozempic or semaglutide. Elon Musk says he's taking Ozempic or semaglutide. Why? Well, now you can see the results of the newer trials with the same GLP-1 drug, but used at higher doses. And this is a once a week medicine, semaglutide, 2.4 milligrams once a week. And now if you actually look at these numbers, the amount of weight loss that people are getting, 17, 18% body weight loss. So what does that mean? If you're 100 kilograms, you know, you're losing 18 or 20 kilograms. If you're 200 pounds, you're losing 30, 40 pounds. So this is starting to get people's attention and the potential for improving people's health who are living with obesity, I think, is substantial. So I mentioned briefly GLP-2. It's related to GLP-1. It has a very different action. It doesn't work on your metabolism to control glucose or to control your body weight. It actually works on the lining of your gut, which normally has a very important function. It's supposed to absorb the digested nutrients from the food we eat and allow us to access those digested proteins and fats and carbohydrates as energy when the nutrients cross from our gut into our bloodstream. But there are a lot of people with intestinal damage from inflammation or from surgery. And some people have a lot of their intestine removed and they end up with a condition called short bowel syndrome which means they have to be fed intravenously to stay alive because they don't have enough gut present to allow them to digest and absorb their food. So we discovered, you know, almost 20 years ago that GLP-2 talked to the gut and stimulated gut growth. And you can see here I'm plotting some data from mouse experiments, and these are some GLP-2 producing tumors we put into animals, and we can more than double the size of the mouse gut. So this is not a small effect. This isn't like a 5% thing. This is, you know, more than two, almost two and a half fold doubling with these tumors. And with GLP-2 alone, we can get a, 
a 1.5 fold effect. So we wondered, could this be helpful to people who had damaged their guts or had their guts removed surgically who were dependent on intravenous nutrition? And after a lot of work to develop medicines based on GLP-2, we got the results. And so Taduglutide is the GLP-2 medicine we discovered in our lab, and it was given to people with what we call short bowel syndrome. They were missing substantial amounts of their intestines, so they required intravenous food, intravenous nutrition to stay alive. And when they were given this medicine, Taduglutide, shown as you know Ted here, then they could often reduce the number of nights that they had to hook themselves up to intravenous nutrition. And about 10 to 15% of the people could discontinue the need for intravenous nutrition completely. So this is pretty striking because if you are always having to hook yourself every night to intravenous nutrition to stay alive, when somebody says, you know, do you want to come to my place and sleep over? Do you want to come to our family's place on the lake for the weekend and hang out? Do you want to go on holiday, uh, et cetera? You, you always have to say no, because you need to go to your place every night to be hooked up to intravenous nutrition to stay alive. So being able to free up a few nights a week or completely come off intravenous nutrition is a huge improvement in quality of life. And there's lots of stories like this on the internet that really um, are, are meaningful to me. So this is one of the young ladies, uh, Ava, who was in the clinical trial for this medicine, Taduglutide, in Boston. And you can find this on the internet, on YouTube, uh, or through the Boston Children's Hospital. And this young woman had short bowel syndrome as a, as a child. She had to be hooked up to intravenous nutrition every night. She did not have much uh, quality of life, very limiting. Uh, and she managed to completely come off intravenous nutrition and now you know, well on her way to a normal life on this medicine. So these kind of stories, you know, resonate with me because when you're doing science in the lab, sometimes the clinical impact can be a long way off if, if it is uh, in your future at all. So having these uh, discoveries translated into medicines is very rewarding for me. Now, as I mentioned, that's not all I did. Um, you know, I'm a physician and MD, and uh, I love the outdoors and uh, activities and stuff. And I spent uh, quite a number of years, you can see here, if you can do the math, uh, about 17 years as camp doctor at a summer camp uh, in Ontario. This is our uh, little medical uh, golf cart that we had. That's one of our nurse Sue's and another one of our nurses, her daughter, my wife, Cheryl, and of course me uh, barely hanging on in the back. And that was a lot of fun. And we did that, as I said, for 17 years, I would go up for almost four and a half weeks to summer camp and uh, got to do all the stuff that the campers did and also got to have my kids attend at the same time. Uh, I love to play golf. I'm, I'm not very good. Um, probably have about a 17 handicap. I'm sure a lot of the people listening have a much lower handicap if you play golf. But because of my science, I've had some cool invitations to uh, play at different golf courses. So some of you who are real keen golfers will recognize this hole. This is the 16th hole at Augusta National in Georgia where the Masters Tournament was played. And it's hard to get on this course. You have to know a member who then invites you. And so it's a long story, but it was directly related to my research that I got to play Augusta National. Now, I, I love playing sports and watching sports, um, and I probably would have been a lot more successful and, and smarter for longer, but I went to a Blue Jays game um, a number of years ago, and, and you can see here, this is the former manager of the Blue Jays, Cedar Gaston, uh, and this is me having been hit in the head uh, with a broken bat and knocked unconscious, and I was bleeding uh, like crazy and had a major concussion, and this was on national TV. So, uh, you know, a little bit of a setback. I needed a lot of stitches, but I came back and watched the end of the game and got two standing ovations. Um, and, and now Major League Baseball has extended the netting, which used to just go to partly over the dugout. And now it goes all the way down the first baseline and the third baseline. I won't take complete credit for that because a lot of people have been hit by balls and 
and bats, but you can see my sporting experience has been somewhat uh, varied. And of course, the most important thing to me is, is actually not the science and not the sports or, or not the travel, but it's uh, my family. And so um, this is an older picture. There are a couple of uh, more grandchildren have uh, joined the, the roster and, and the kids are older now. Um, but uh, the most fun thing that I do and the thing that I enjoy the most and my biggest priority is just hanging out with uh, my grown sons and their wives and their children. And um, yes, this weekend, my son, uh, one of my sons was away and I was on duty for the hockey rink for some of the grandchildren and had two games on Saturday and two games on Sunday. And um, to me, that that's what it's all about. So yeah, I definitely love science and it's been great to me. Um, but there are a lot of other things you can do while still being a science and, and never lose sight of that. So this is a summary and we'll get to some questions now. But, you know, I started doing the science, I think, as I mentioned, around 1984 when I entered the lab. So it's it's almost three decades now of discovery after discovery in this area that have made it uh, possible to develop medicines based on how these hormones work. And obviously, the number of new medicines based on particularly GLP-1 is continuing to increase uh, you know, very rapidly. And there's more and more enthusiasm and more and more excitement about the potential of these medicines to help people with chronic metabolic disorders. And this type of medicine is now being studied in people with liver disease. It's being studied in people with heart failure. There's even phase three trials underway for people with Alzheimer's disease, which we know is a very common and, and devastating problem. So I think there's still a lot of fun and a lot of uh, clinical promise and uh, potentially more impact on people living with these chronic disorders. And so if you get lucky, and I always say I've won the lottery over and over and over again, because not only did I get to do some interesting science, but I got to see it translated into medicines. And that's really winning the lottery, so to speak. Uh, and sometimes people get lucky and you can have an amazing time like I do. I love to go into work. I have fun every day. Uh, and I also have fun when I leave work, as I hope I've conveyed to you. So that's the story. These are the people in my lab who have uh, participated. This is what Toronto looks like on a nice uh, sunny day and be delighted now to uh, take some questions from anyone that might want to drill down on other, you know, how I played at Augusta National or how I got so lucky in science or anything in between. What, or what about the bat hitting you? We might want more detail on that. I mean, yeah, really no, it was uh, it was Vernon Wells. Um, oh. I can give you a lot more detail on on the bat hitting me as well, but it's just one of those things. Huh. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for a spectacular presentation. I know we've got some live classes in the background ready for questions in a minute, so I'll give you guys a, a second to percolate with those questions before I come to Ms. Ball's class first. But I'm really curious. You talked about the Gila monster and the venom, and you had anglerfish on that final slide there. How do you know to even look in these animal models for things like why choose those species? Are you constantly doing animal experiments to find potential drugs or, or potential things that you can use? Or, or how does that even happen? Yeah, so we all know that if, um, you know, if you uh, kiss a frog, um, you could turn into a princess or you could wake up if you were asleep, etc. So th there's a long history of people realizing that in the venoms, of these reptiles or frogs or snakes. There are very powerful uh, substances beyond those that kill you. There are also things that will affect your, your blood clotting and, and your coagulation and your, your heart. So people have long looked at the venom of frogs and snakes and reptiles for potential medicines. And in fact, there are medicines developed um, for preventing clotting disorders, for example, based on the fact that when some snakes bite you, you can bleed to death based on what the snake has injected into you. So this has been a long sort of subset of scientists and some scientists simply sequenced all of the peptides that started with a histidine at position one to uncover new bioactive peptides from this Gila monster. And they came up with this molecule that looked like GLP-1. And they called it Exendin because it came from the salivary gland. So it was an exocrine gland EX, but it had endocrine-like activity. So that was the END, END, and that was John Eng at the Bronx VA. And, and he patented this, and he went around to all the pharmaceutical companies who thought he was not functioning normally to have this vision 
but he was correct. So there's a long story of medicines coming from uh, venom and, and stuff for the treatment of human disease. I'm really glad. Uh, one thing that I've noticed throughout the whole presentation is you take such pains to highlight colleagues and other scientists and researchers and collaborators in your family. And I think that's really important for our students to hear. So I, I'm glad you did that. But it, it's interesting that you talk about this. We've got the big biodiversity conference happening in Montreal in just a couple days. And one of the things that a lot of scientists have been highlighting is uh, aside from general worth, economic development, uh, you know, indigenous rights to land, one of the things that is a, a sort of medical reason to support the preservation of biodiversity is that every time we look, we find these compounds, we find things in plants and in animals that can go on to change the world in a really positive way. And so it, it behooves us to preserve those places and really do a thorough study to find more. Yeah, so like 100%. Like in, in medicine, I think many of your students are familiar with this technique called PCR. And maybe because during COVID-19, they had to have a PCR test to validate the rapid antigen test. And this is called polymerase chain reaction. And it's a method for amplifying your DNA. And, and this enzyme that does the amplification uh, came from these bacteria that could survive uh, you know, in very hot places and was thermostable. So you're hundred percent right. Understanding the diversity of life, whether it's bacteria or fungi or yeast or fish or reptiles can be very valuable, not just for the pure sake of knowledge, but can often have scientific and medical implications that we would not have appreciated. Yep, spectacular. Um, Ms. Balls class, Goderich, I'm gonna to come to you. If you have a question for us, come on in and take us away. Hey. Hey, Jesse, we're just switching between classes, but one question that came up while we were doing some research for this was, why does high blood sugar create all of these problems? Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's a great question. And, and the answer is, is multifactorial. But, but it's thought to change the expression of, of genes and proteins and then the function of your uh, organs so that over time your, your eyes and your kidneys and your heart and your blood vessels don't work as well, sometimes directly because there's too much uh, blood sugar on some of the proteins, so the proteins don't work well. Other times, the presence of high blood sugar increases inflammation, and inflammation causes the complications in your organ. So there isn't one simple example, but having an elevated blood sugar makes many of your normally bodily functions start to work inappropriately or less well. And over time, that produces the complications of diabetes that we are challenged with. Yeah, I figured we'd get that question, so thanks for that, Ms. Paul's class. Um, Mr. Dupuis class, St. Thomas More, Lafayette, Louisiana, if you guys want to come in for a question, you're good to go. Hey, guys. Yeah, I do have a question for you today, thanks. Um, one thing, too, I want to say that I talked, we talked about the um, things that plants, the power of plants. If you go back to New Orleans and uh, NSTA from about 2008, there was a guy that did a keynote. It was uh, He spent time with the medicine men in the Amazon. Really cool stuff. Cool. But what I wanted to ask Dr. Drucker was, what are the chances that my doctor down here in Louisiana is on the same wavelength and understands some of the things that you uh, are talking about? How, or better yet, if I wanted him to, how could I do that professionally without, you know, insulting him? Yeah. Yeah. So, so first of all, let me um, just remind you that um, in Louisiana, down the road, you have some of the world's experts in metabolism, um, for example, at Tulane University or in uh, Pennington, uh, where there's a, a world-class institute in research in metabolism and obesity and diabetes. And they're very familiar with uh, the innovation in, in this field. So I, I wouldn't worry at all about not being able to find these people. Now, I think you raise a broader issue, which we call knowledge translation. And sometimes there's a gap between knowledge translation and how that filters down to the healthcare providers we might see either in our hospitals or our medical clinics or sometimes we walk into Walmart or CVS where there's a, a clinic and, and that's common in all fields of medicine. So it takes time. Some of the studies that I just showed you for these weight loss drugs, these are one or two years old and not every healthcare practitioner is going to be up to speed on all of the new innovations, just because they're extremely busy and they have to cover so many areas of medicine. So it, it takes a little bit of research to uh, find out what your healthcare practitioner is, you know, really uh, focused on and what his or her uh, expertise 
uh, is focused on. And sometimes you have the world's best doctor and they know exactly about the stuff that you are interested in talking about. Other times, you know, you, you do your own research and you can get some nudges going or they'll refer you to someone else. But but that happens in Toronto. It happens in New York. It happens in Houston, uh, Ottawa. There's a, a tremendous often variability in which healthcare professionals are keeping up with what topic. And, and it does take probably five to 10 years, we know, from the time the latest medical advances ultimately become widely known in the local clinic. So don't be surprised or disappointed if your local person isn't immediately the expert in this rapidly evolving area. It just takes a little time and sometimes a little nudging and help and support. I want to harp on this for a second because midway through the talk, you talked about the fact that Kim Kardashian and Elon Musk have been talking about this and sharing things on social media. And I know a lot of people now get their medical advice, uh, perhaps wrongly from Facebook, from Twitter first. Is there a general recommendation of where people should go to find out things about this? Is it their local doctor? Is it a certain health sites? Are there any resources that you'd really recommend for people to learn about the latest? In yeah, so I, I think reputable um, professional associations um, are, are a good start. And, and many of them, whether it's the Endocrine Society or the American Diabetes Association or the Obesity Society, and many like this, um, are good places to start because they will carefully vet the credibility and accuracy of the information. Um, you know, in my area of metabolism, there are about, you know, 10 billion experts because we all eat we all worry about our weight. We all worry about our metabolism. We all have what we call end of one experiences. And you find that on the internet that every single person, you know, I have a Twitter account. I have 20,000 people that follow me and I'll often have people argue with me or people refute what I'm saying because they ate something or they tried to lose weight or they had an experience. And so that's very, very common. And so one has to be a little cautious about taking uh, information on the internet or social media from a small group of people or a couple of individuals. I would start with the professional societies and organizations that are uh, very careful to vet the accuracy of their information. Because, uh, you know, I call social media and the internet, it's, it's kind of a swamp and, and you find good stuff in that swamp as we're aware, but you can also like you know, sink in, in some of that stuff. So you got to be careful. <laughs> or get eaten by an alligator. Right. Either way. Um, we have time for three more questions. Time flies and you're having fun on these broadcasts. Um, I'm going to go back to Ms. Ball and Mr. Dupuy in that order in a second. But first, you know, you, you showcased this decades of, of career with all these changes that have happened in the field. And we know that science is changing so quickly now. I mean, even the, the race to develop the COVID vaccine, sort of a classic case study of how incredible um, the, the developments in technological application of these things can sort of reach the, you know, reach the world. So I'm curious with things like CRISPR, which we're talking about later this week with protein folding, you know, sort of being partnered with artificial intelligence, all these changes that are happening. Do you find that things in your field are, are really rapidly advancing? Is it easy to keep up? What's the situation? So, you know, I'm going to say something that um, might be controversial to a high school audience, but um, you got to love to learn. And so sometimes when you're a student, those are the best of times and the worst of times for, for the reasons we all know. Sometimes your teachers are not as good as you'd like them to be. Sometimes the homework is overwhelming. Sometimes the class is, is boring. And, and sometimes, you know, we have just years of our school that we didn't have uh, as much fun as we'd like. But, you know, I think it, it beats learning as a student beats working hard for a living almost all of the time. And if you can find an area where not only are you constantly learning, but you're getting paid to do that, which is science or many domains of education, um, then that's to me the best of both worlds. So is it hard to keep up? Sure, because information is exploding. Advances are everywhere. You have to follow multiple areas. Every morning I get up and I do a search for what's new in my area. And it takes me an hour or two just to say what happened last night and, and what's new in my area. But but I get paid to do that. Can you imagine getting paid to have fun and learn new stuff? And that's what you get to do in many areas of science and education. So um, couldn't ask for a better vocation. I always love highlighting this to students, whether it's a Gardner Awards presentation or whoever we bring on the broadcast, that, you know, it, it seems daunting to think, you know, oh, you finish high school and then you get a bachelor's degree and quite often a PhD and the years of education that that takes. 
but you end that and you're really young and now you're in a position where you get to work with people around the world you get to go play on augusta you get to be hit by baseball bats you get to have fun and learn awesome. for an hour each morning and i mean that's there, there's no better job than that in the world and you get to play doing what you love for the rest of your life and have a real positive impact and i think that's an extraordinary thing about science so i'm really glad you answered it that way yeah. Um, let's head back to Ms. Ball's class. One more from you guys, and then we'll head back to Lafayette to wrap up. Uh, come on in, Goddard. Hey. Hey. Uh, I just wondered, because you mentioned about the Kardashians, et cetera, taking Ozempic. So should everyone be taking Ozempic? Uh, no. In, in fact, we, we have um, worldwide shortages now of these newer GLP-1-based medicines, probably largely because of manufacturing challenges, but also... Um, the demand is exceeding the uh, supply right now. And, you know, the companies are working hard to fix uh, that supply demand imbalance. But we are concerned that people who need to take these medicines to treat their diabetes, to treat their obesity, are sometimes having trouble finding the medicines because some people want to lose 10 or 15 pounds before their, you know, cousin's wedding so they can look good, which is not a medically necessary uh, sort of use of the medicine. So the answer is no, you should only be using these medicines if there's a, a proven benefit. And uh, I would leave for the time being the desire to lose a little bit of weight to look better uh, aside until we have an adequate supply. And you can then discuss with your healthcare practitioner whether this medicine is, is right for you. But right now, let's stick to the approved use and not deprive people who need the medicine of the ability to obtain it. Yeah. And I think a lot of classes will be familiar with this. We found this with some drugs over the course of the pandemic. And so uh, I'm really glad we got that message. And thanks, Ms. Paul. Um, St. Thomas More, one more question from you guys, and we'll wrap up from there. Come on in. Yeah, or it's 50 degrees Celsius, I think, in your world. We're, um, we're over here at about 76 degrees in our Fahrenheit scale. Do you want to ask a question? This is a little bit more generic about diabetes. I'm asking this for a student, but I'm going to put this in my perspective. I have type 2 diabetes, was diagnosed when I was about... 40 years old, and no one in my family that I know of has diabetes, and I've got a mom that has 12 siblings, my dad had two siblings. Is it possible or is more likely that it popped up with me that my son uh, may also develop diabetes one day? I guess it becomes- Yeah, so that's, that's a great question, and the, and the answer is yes. So um, there is a very strong genetic uh, contribution to the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. It's not one gene that we're worried about that we focus on, but it's probably hundreds of different genes all contributing a very small amount of risk. And those hundreds of different genes might be somewhat different in, in different individuals, but the answer is, is yes. So once you have people in your family who have a history of type 2 diabetes, that does increase your risk of type 2 diabetes. And it's just something that, you know, as you get older and you become at greater risk for more chronic diseases associated with age, that you just have that in the back of your mind. And maybe you use it as a motivation to be as healthy as you can, or you, you bring it up to your family uh, physician as something to keep an eye out for. But the answer is definitely yes. Uh, thanks, John, for being willing to share that in the program. I really appreciate that. And uh, Daniel, this has been uh, a lot of fun. Thank you for sharing your expertise, your passion. This has been a, a great kickoff to our Gardner Awards series of programs. I know our two teachers that are live with us today are joining us for several others over the course of the week. Uh, but if you want to check out more on the Gardner Foundation in general, the amazing work that they do, check out the website below. And then Daniel's online on Twitter, as he said, with his many, many followers there. Um, you've got some websites associated with you that I've been checking out. They might be a little beyond some of our students, but but if people are keen to learn more about the research that you're up to and find out more about the work that you do, they can check out the links that are on the screen. And all of our programs are going to be on our YouTube channel if anyone wants to check out this one again or the remainder. Uh, Daniel, before we wrap up, is there any last message you want to share with our classes before I bring them in to say thank you and farewell? No, the, the only thing I want to say is that, you know, when I was in high school, um, it wasn't always clear to me that science was the greatest thing. I had to memorize all these formulas and the math was complicated and I couldn't understand the physics and, you know, organic chemistry w was challenging and uh, so on and so forth. Um, but ultimately, you can find areas of science that you love. It's a huge field, whether it's studying plants or looking at ecology, worried about the environment. Uh, and so there's so many things you can do in science 
to both have fun, make important contributions to society and get paid and make a living. So I'm really positive on science going forward. I think it's a great place to be and, um, you know, keep your uh, your eyes open for cool things in science. I think it's going to be a great way for many of us to spend our time and very helpful to our societies. Dr. Drucker, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in Ms. Bowles class, Mr. Dupuis class, say a big thank you and farewell. We'll wrap up there. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, guys. Thanks, everyone.